properly, but I never thought, you know, when we <laughs> thought we'd revisit this uh, topic, this subject, Bold in the Cliffs, uh, down on the Isle of Wight, that it would uh, open up quite such a plethora of avenues to, to yeah. go down. So many exciting discoveries uh, and so much to uh, to talk about. Yeah. Uh, I'm amazed. Can of worms springs to mind. Uh, it really is. Uh, yeah, where do you start, really? I mean, there's so many little discoveries from this piece of archaeology. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, just uh, toss in things like the oldest piece of string that we've known in Britain. It's just, a, it's a little nugget, you know, uh, things like yeah. that. But you wouldn't expect that from marine like archaeology. That. Think, things to look yes. forward to. But before we, uh, you know, get off, let's just, you know, place ourselves geographically and uh, uh, what exactly it is we're, we're talking about. Um, back in around about 2015-16, there was a lot about this in the press because it came out that uh, the headline was um, uh, boat building site, measleth, 8,000 year old boat building site discovered in the Solent or 11 metres underwater uh, as mm. it is, um, which is exciting enough in itself, we could say that and, and move on. But probably those articles probably missed a lot of the detail behind that. And of course, it's been work going on at the place uh, uh, ever since. So we're talking about Bolton Cliffs, which is about a kilometre east of uh, Yarmouth on the north coast of the Isle of Wight in the bit of water between uh, mainland Britain and the Isle of Wight, which is called the Solent. Um, we're talking about a site that's been dated to, as I said, 6,000 thereabouts B, uh, BC at a time at which, of course, it wasn't un underwater. It was, um, and that's the point about how this place became, be be came to be uh, uh, discovered, is that it was a wooded site where this place was now, was then... Uh, a river with, with you know, with uh, with woodland around about, and it's the woodland on the shore now, and going down into the depths of eleven meters, still there. The evidence of oak and hazel and all those kinds of uh, trees still poking out of the the surface um, that uh, gave the game away d down there, but wasn't, but wasn't necessarily what alerted people to the fact that. Well, there's human activity down there. Well, the here. actual discovery uh, uh, go, goes, the actual goes back discovery, quite a bit earlier, yeah. actually. It was 1999 that there was uh, work being That's done. Right. And uh, some very observant uh, diver noticed that there was a lobster clearing out its burrow. And on closer inspection saw that the lobster was throwing out worked pieces of flint. So <laughs> so this site was discovered, basically, because of a lobster, which uh, you can't ask for a more beautiful piece yeah. of archaeology than that, can you, really? Uh, no, <laughs> you, you can't. Uh, uh, but that, that brought to light so many different things, didn't it? I mean, down this, uh, because that gave rise to research down this whole stretch, and... And you're talking mm. about a stretch of coast there, which is uh, it's a, a kilometre or so long, with yeah. various sites, worked sites uh, throughout that length. Is it five sites mm. along that stretch, Mike? Uh, four or five? Uh, there are five, uh, yeah, archa uh, archaeological yeah, sites and, that they've uh, defined as, as being uh, worthy with of interest. The, uh, with worked timber, basically. We know that people were exploiting this... Uh, this patch of uh, what would have been the river estuary uh, with uh, with mm. timber walkways at least and as you said uh, boat yeah. building the, the interpretation has been that this <clears throat> this site at Boldner is um, is a boat building site um, which is there, there is some contention there are some people who don't believe there's enough evidence to say that it's actually boat building but um, but the mm. main researchers are quite convinced that that's what we're looking at uh, and also interesting that that the the woodworking techniques are not what was expected to be found there at all you know more about that don't you michael um yes i don't want to do a deep dive on that yet we'll come come back to that but a, a few more sort of broad uh, aspects uh, to the, the site the the thing about this site as well in the context of 
discoveries from the Mesolithic in uh, Britain as a whole um, is that this site alone now accounts for 50% 50, 50 and above of the known worked wood <laughs> dating to the Mesolithic, both early Mesolithic and, and, and later. You know, that's... that's uh, and the other, you know, not that many um, Mesolithic uh, settlement sites, uh, Star Car being the uh, the most famous, and that's famed for its platforms, for goodness sakes, its walkways and what have you, uh, uh, timber. The other place I'm thinking about, of course, is um, is Blick Mead. Blick Mead, indeed, yes. Which is also by water. Mm. And I don't think it would be right to visualise the site that we're thinking about now as being on a river estuary. It was actually, I think it was actually on a river. The, the, there was a river running down, you know, where the, the Solent is now. And the actual meeting, you know, of the river with the, with the sea would have been still a way off. So what we're looking at is if it's a boat building site, it's on a river, not next to the sea. And I think that was a misconception that I first got from it, you know, knowing where it is on the Solent. And I thought, wow, boat building site on the sea. No, it's uh, it's n not that way, I don't think. Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think you should, uh, or we should lose sight of quite how how long an estuary can be. Um, sure. Uh, but uh, uh, it, as you say, I mean, it's, uh, it's at a period in time where, uh, particularly when Britain was was separating from uh, from uh, uh, mainland Europe at that time, that obviously boat building would have been becoming increasingly important as that gap was yeah. widening, you know, and... Uh, yeah. Well, anybody that's, you know, been on a boat on a river will know what the, the difficulties, you know, boat building aside, the difficulties of making a clean dismount <laughs> or even you know yeah. or even getting into a, a boat that may be even partially you know unstable um that you a platform of some sort a flat area stable mm. area of some sort is a really important part of uh, mm. um, boating of uh, getting in and out of boats at all and that is Especially one of the principal reasons why some uh, some archaeologists aren't totally convinced that there's any boat building related here that yeah. uh, that if there were wooden walkways little harbor if you like where you know you could pull your boat up alongside so that you climbed out without tipping yourself over um, yeah yeah but Gary uh, Momba, who's the chief archaeologist uh, in charge of the operations down there, he's the uh, chief executive officer at the Maritime Archaeology Trust uh, down there. Um, the other thing he's, he does point out, and I'm coming back to the wooden thing again, and I think the main reason uh, that the, the wooden structures at all the wooden remains at Bolden Cliffs have been singled out is because they do display um, certainly <clears throat> one technique of working that um, is normally associated with activities much later. Um, and that is the uh, distinction between uh, the radial splitting of wood and the tangential splitting of wood. The tangentials, if you split wood radially... Ta tangential, you, you, don't, don't say tangential, people will start sending letters in. Ta <laughs> OK. <laughs> tangential. Yes, that's correct, isn't it? Tangential. Oh, Tan tangentially, yes. Um, if, you, if you split wood radially, radially you end up with wedge-shaped pieces of wood. In order to get planks, it's, it's, the, it's to get planks out of a, a bit of wood that you need to split it uh, tangentially. Did I say that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, isn't it? It's amazing how th that technique is associated with two thousand years later. So yes. uh, you know, it, it's not like it was just uh, you know a few centuries before. This is a massive backward step in time of people using sophisticated woodworking techniques, which is, yeah. you know, that's quite significant. And although they don't have one piece of wood that is this size, they've been able to work out from the planks that they do have 
from such things as the type of tree that it's from, the age, whether it was slow grown, you know, the the size it could have been from the uh, if it's slow grown oak or something like that. They could they could be dealing with planks that are up to two meters wide and ten to twenty meters in length. Mm. That's something. I mean, that really is something. Mm. Um, you know, uh, and w- and whether that could be used in the construction of a boat or whether that is part of the construction of whatever platform uh, this is. Mm. The only thing I can come away from you know this aspect of <clears throat> the whole thing is this must have been so busy. Yeah. So they must have been so busy on the river there. Yeah. Whatever that we're doing, getting in and out of boats, putting things in boats, taking things out, the the fishing, you know, the, 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 it was, mm. um, yeah, it would have been quite a, it would have been an activity point for a, quite a large number of people for that kind of concentrated effort to mm. be going into it to um, yeah, do that. And did we mention the string? Yes, we did. We, we mentioned it, yes. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, Hanging stuff together. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, they, they found along that stretch, I mean, they found, uh, you know, a, a thousand pieces of worked flint. They found other tools. Uh, so clearly, busy, busy. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, yeah. uh, and when you think that this is what they're finding from 11 metres underwater... Uh, yeah. it, you know, it's it's very difficult to excavate anything in those conditions. Mm. So the fact that they found that number of stuff, you know, there must have been. In fact, there's probably still a ton and a half down there. Yeah. So it's hard hard to overstate the importance of this site. You know, the headline joking aside about lobsters and uh, you know uh, uh, it being a boat building site. That's you know, jury's out on that. Uh, there's lots more to t- talk about in that. Um, actually, before we do, Rupert, if I could say a couple of words about the channel for uh, dear uh, I think there. rude not to. No, absolutely. The thing is, we're <laughs> thrilled to be able to say that the first fruits of uh, our Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge project have uh, just made an appearance on the channel. Um, we've got over two hours of content from Gobekli Tepe which you can watch now, stuff that I guarantee you you won't find anywhere else because we had exclusive access to the site over three days back in November. Mm. And there are five programmes in all to watch, uh, all under the banner of three days at Gobekli Tepe. Please do have a look. You won't be disappointed. However, that's just the beginning of things. Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge is our huge, massive, crazy (laughs) <laughs> what were we thinking of? <laughs> Definitely crazy. Uh, current project that aims to tie it all together and tell the story of the Neolithic from the Levant and the Fertile Crescent all the way to the plains of Wiltshire. Um, but we need your help. Please do pay a visit to our Buy Me A Coffee page where you'll find out more about the project and uh, ways you can support us. Or alternatively, you could uh, subscribe to us on Patreon. You know, which uh, not only helps us do what we do and keeps us going, um, but you get the inside story on what's going on behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, and of course, there's a there's a weekly podcast that's exclusive to Patreon. Yes, there's anyway, a lot of exclusive uh, content stop. on the Patreon site as well. So uh, I mean, think about it. There's masses of well, I mean, of stuff there. There's four or five years worth of yeah, stuff. I haven't done a count recently. Yeah. So if you like this kind of stuff, wow, knock yourselves out. <laughs> Links to both those support avenues uh, are in the description below, and we look forward to seeing you around. Oh. Thanks for watching uh, right now. But uh, if you could, please do us a favour. Check to see if you're subscribed. It's amazing how many people watch this channel who are not subscribed. Um, Something ridiculous, like 80%, something like that. Uh, We're aiming to get 100,000 subscribers before the year is out. And uh, you never know, your click might make all the difference. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Enough said. Onwards. What more? about Bolden Cliffs. I we have think, to talk about uh, wheat. It, well, I was just going to say the very same thing, yeah. Because uh, the, uh, they uh, they did 
sedimentary uh, DNA analysis and that revealed well it was that that revealed actually the fact that uh, we were looking at an area of uh, oak forest really and lots of herbaceous plants mm-hmm. but that was the biggest shock was uh, was yes einkorn wheat it's uh, not the sort of thing you go looking for no <laughs> there would because the original project you know is not to do because uh, they didn't know the settlement was there um, but it was uh, to do with examining climate change, you know, back in the day, back in the in the Mesolithic, at the time when, um, you know, it, this is the end of the Ice Age, you know, the, the seas are rising. Um, so it was examining that. So the, the sedimentary DNA thing it was a matter of course. We're examining what kind of woods were down there, what was growing, uh, not down there, but, you know, what was growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back in the time, so they weren't looking, you know, and uh, lo and behold, um, the uh, genetic fingerprint of uh, einkorn uh, comes up. What do you do with that? Yes, it's very contentious and a lot of people don't like it. (laughs) Mm. Well, I suppose we should say, why is that contentious? Mm. Uh, Well, we're not thought to have had wheat in Britain until... A lot later. Um, Mm. And because it's such an isolated finding, you know, it's not like they've found anything that supports that in different areas. It's such a unique find that uh, that there's been arguments about contamination, for example, but that has been very hotly dismissed by the researchers themselves, um, Mm. you know, because, you know... The, the thing to bear in mind with that kind of research is that you can't really be accepting the things that you're comfortable with, so the fact that they've got oak woods and the fact that they've got herbaceous plants, Lovely. and, and all, then say, oh, well, we don't like the wheat. Yeah. No, you've got to be wrong on that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's um, it's really very compelling, and, and it does push back, uh, dare I say it, farming, uh, by a very long way. Now, whether that's uh, people are importing grain uh, into Britain or whether they're growing it in Britain, we don't know. It's unknowable at this stage. But uh, it's, yes, it, it's, yeah. Well, I I wouldn't say it you know, pushes back farming per se, but it provi- it makes a huge problem of explanation because, as far as we know, farming had only got as far as the Balkans or you know. <laughs> bits of the Mediterranean by this time. Yes. There. So uh, how that, was it making that is the extra the, journey? That's the point, isn't it? Yes, uh, but that's the point throughout all of this, isn't it? That yeah, what happens yeah. with, with any aspect of archaeology, particularly when people talk about it's the earliest this and the earliest that, well, it's the earliest that we've found. It's not the necessarily the earliest anything. It's the earliest found. And when you think of the the fact that most of the heavily exploited regions are still heavily exploited today. People are living there. So there's there's all this stuff that is still, you know, way underneath our villages. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, there's an awful lot of coastal villages. Uh, and so the fact that something does get found... Uh, you know, we should be we should be just as cautious about being uh, astonished by it because you know it's, it's we know that farming got to uh, the Balkans and yeah. well it's not that far it's not that far. I tell you what, we need another lobster. <laughs> we do need another lobster. We need more lobster. lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> we need to find uh, a yeah. few. <laughs> a yeah. few more, uh, yeah, uh, submerged Mesolithic sites uh, in order to prove, <laughs> uh, w- or, yeah, mm. to, uh, gosh, to leave Bolna Cliffs as some kind of uh, anomaly. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? What is it with the Mesolithic sites that we have that have, you know, are providing real uh, narratives and stories from that time, you know, the, the significant ones. What is it What is it with Mesolithic sites and platforms? <laughs> they just seem to happen, you know, these s- permanent sites mm. which seem to be f- few and far between. It kind of makes sense, I suppose, that they're all by water and if they're by water, like I said, I'm going in the circular argument here, you're by water you need platforms to launch do your riverside uh, activities uh, uh, but also it's the fact that they're near water 
uh, mm. or, or like given given the case of star car but, sorry yeah but that's what's given rise to their preservation isn't it so mm. yeah. uh, so if it was uh, platforms being made in land or in drier areas then that's where the timber would just have completely disintegrated over time so it's not really surprising that the evidence for timber work would be in the damper swampy marshy whatever just damper areas yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I think we must have been really, really very good woodworkers for a very, very long time. It's mm. just so rare that evidence crops up for it, isn't it? Mm-mm-mm. Anyway, I think that's about as much as we can chew over in this uh, yeah. short term yeah. and uh, t- short time. And I hope that um, uh, sparked your interest enough uh, to pursue it further. But first place to go would be the Maritime Archaeological Trust um, website uh, down there. It sparked our interest certainly so much that uh, we mm. think uh, we'd like to get in touch with Gary Momber. Gary Momber, if you're watching, um, uh, yes. <laughs> look <laughs> yes, out for an Gary. email. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah. you know, we'd, uh, we'd love to talk. Uh, and also, mm. we'd love to go down to um, um, wherever it is. I don't think it's in uh, on the Isle of Wight, or is it? Uh, there's, a, there's a shipwreck um, uh, to do with the Marine Archaeology Trust. There's a the museum. shipwreck yeah. museum, yes, mm. and a lot of the artefacts from uh, Bolden Cliff are uh, in there, so uh, must find an excuse to go south and, uh, and yes. cross the Solent. Let's be <laughs> honest, it won't be hard to find the excuse. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, is true. All right, folks. Cool. Uh, yeah, hope Thanks you for enjoyed watching. that. <laughs> Till the next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.